This episode is sponsored by Audible. Audible is a leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, and they have over 100,000 titles available for download. Visit audibletrial.com slash the scald circle to begin your trial and download your free audiobook today. It's time to relax, grab a drink, pull up a chair by the hearth, and have a seat in the scald circle to listen to chapters 7 through 9 of the Volsanga Saga, as told by Casimir. Before we begin our story, we want to remind you that we release new stories for free every week. Our shorter tales release on Wednesdays, and our longer chapter stories release every other Saturday. Find out where you can hear them on our website at thescaldcircle.com. And be certain to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, or whatever your favorite podcast app is. That way, you'll never miss out on one of our enchanting tales from around the world. In addition to our reminder, we have some exciting news for the month of July. You've likely noticed that our format sounds a little bit different. Not only that, but you may have heard, in addition to our story releases on Wednesdays, we will also now be releasing longer chapter-length stories every other Saturday. As if that isn't exciting enough, starting on July 9th, we will begin hosting Fireside Stories with the Skull Circle at 7 p.m. Central Time every other Thursday. Our Fireside Stories will be a live stream of my Nogan and I regaling you with stories you may have never heard before, along with some of our very own witty banter. So, if you want to experience what a live show from the Skull Circle is like, that may be of interest to you. You can find more details under the events section on our website. Chapter 7. Of the birth of Sinfjotli, the son of Sigmund. So on a tide it befell as Signy sat in her bower, that there came to her a cunning witchwife, exceeding cunning, and Signy talked with her in such wise. Fain am I, says she, that we should change semblances together. She says, even as thou wilt then. And so by her wiles she brought it about that they change semblances. And now the witch-wife sits in Signy's place, according to her red, and goes to bed by the king that night, and he knows not that he has other than Signy beside him. But the tale tells of Signy that she fared to the earth-house of her brother, and prayed him give her a harboring for the night. For I have gone astray abroad in the woods, and know not whither I am going. So he said she might abide, and that he would not refuse harbor to one lone woman deeming that she would scarce pay back his good cheer by tail-bearing. So she came into the house, and they sat down to meet, and his eyes were often upon her, and a goodly and fair woman she seemed to him. But when they are full then, he says to her that he is right fain that they should not have but one bed that night. She nowise turned away therefrom, and so for three nights together he laid her in bed by him. Thereafter, she fared home and found the witch-wife, and bade her change semblances again, and she did so. Now as time wears, Signy brings forth a man-child, who is named Sinfjordli, and when he grew up, he was both big and strong and fair of face, and much like unto the kin of the Volsungs. And he was hardly yet ten winters old, when she sent him unto Sigmund's earth-house. But this trial she had made of her sons, or ever she had sent him Sigmund, but this trial she had made of her other sons, or ever she had sent them to Sigmund, that she had sewn gloves onto their hands through flesh and skin, and they had borne it ill and cried out thereafter. And this now she did to Sinfjotli, and he changed countenance in no wise thereat. Then she flayed off the kirtle so that the skin came off with the sleeves, and said that this would be torment enough for him. But, he said, Full little would Volsung have felt such a smart this. So the lad came to Sigmund, and Sigmund bade him knead up their meal, while he goes to fetch firing, and so gave him the meal sack, and then went after the woods, and by then he came back, had Sinfjotli made an end of his baking, then asked Sigmund if he had found nothing in the meal. I misdoubted me that there was something quick in the meal when I first fell to the kneading of it, but I have kneaded it altogether, both the meal and that which was therein, whatsoever it was. Then Sigmund laughed out, and he said, 
Not wilt thou eat of this bread tonight, for the most deadly of worms hast thou kneaded up within. Now Sigmund was so mighty a man, that he might eat venom and have no hurt thereof. But Sinfjotli might abide what so venom came on the outside of him, but might neither eat nor drink thereof. Chapter 8 The Death of King Sigir and of Signy The tale tells that Sigmund thought Sinfjotli over young to help him to his revenge, and will first of all harden him with manly deeds. So in summertide they fare wide through the woods and slay men for their wealth. Sigmund deems him to take much after the kin of the Volsungs, though he thinks that he is Sigir's son and deems him to have the evil heart of his father, with the might and daring of the Volsungs. Withal he must needs think of him in no wise a kinsome man, for full oft would he bring Sigmund's wrongs to his memory and prick him on to slay King Sigir. Now, on a time as they fare abroad in the wood for the gathering of wealth, they find a certain house, and two men with great gold rings asleep therein. Now these twain were spellbound skin changers, and wolf skins were hanging up over them in the house. And every tenth day might they come out of those skins, and they were king's sons. So Sigmund and Sinfjotli do the wolf skins on them, and then might they nowise come out of them, though forsooth the same nature went with them as heretofore. They howled as wolves' howls, but both knew the meaning of that howling. They lay out in the wildwood, and each went his way, and a word they made betwixt them. That they should risk the onset of seven men, but no more, and that he who was first to be set on should howl in wolfish wise. Let us not depart from this, says Sigmund, for thou art young and overbold, and men will deem the quarry good when they take thee. Now each goes his way. And when they are parted, Sigmund meets certain men and gives forth a wolf's howl. And when Sinfjotli heard it, he went straight away thereto and slew them all. And once more they parted, but ere Sinfjotli had fared long through the woods, eleven men meet him, and he wrought in such wise that he slew them all and was awearied therewith, and crawls under an oak and there takes his rest. Then came Sigmund thither and said, why didst thou not call on me? Sinfjotli said, I was loath to call for thy help for the slaying of eleven men. Then Sigmund rushed at him so hard he staggered and fell, and Sigmund bit him in the throat. Now that day they might not come out of their wolfskins, but Sigmund lay the other on his back and bears him home to the house and cursed the wolf gears and gave them to the trolls. Now on a day he saw where two weasels went and how that one bit the other in the throat and then ran straight away into the thicket and took up a leaf and laid it on the wound, and thereon his fellow sprang up quite and clean whole. So Sigmund went out and saw a raven flying with a blade of that same herb to him. So he took it and drew it over Sinfjotli's hurt, and straightway sprang as whole as though he had never been hurt. Thereafter they went home to the earth home, and abode there till the time came for them to put off the wolf shapes. Then they burnt them up in a fire, and prayed that no more hurts might come to any one from them. But in that uncouth guise they wrought many famous deeds in the kingdom and lordship of King Sigir. Now when Sinfjotli was come to man's estate, Sigmund deemed he had tried him fully, and or ever, a long time has gone by, he turns his mind to the avenging of his father. If so it might be brought about, so on a certain day the twain get them gone from the earth house and come to the abode of King Sagir late in the evening, and go into the porch before the hall, wherein were tons of ale. There they lie hid. Now the queen was ware of them, where they are, and is fain to meet them. And when they met they took counsel, and were of one mind that Volsung should be revenged that same night. Now Signy and the king had two children of tender age, who played with a golden toy in the floor, and bowled it along the pavement of the hall running along with it, but therewith a golden ring from off it trundles away into the place where Sigmund and Sinfjotli lay, and off runs the little one to search for the same, and beholds withal where two men were sitting, big and grimly to look on, with overhanging helms and bright white beards. So he runs up into the hall of his father, and tells him of the sight he had seen, and thereat the king misdoubts of some guile abiding him. But Signy heard their speech, 
and arose and took both the children and went out in the porch and said, Lo ye, these younglings have bewrayed you. Come now, therefore, and slay them. Sigmund says, Never will I slay thy children for telling of where I lay hid. But Sinfjotli had made little enow of it, but drew his sword and slew them both, and cast them into the hall at King Sagir's feet. Then stood up the king and cried on his men to take those who had lain privily in the porch through the night. So they ran thither and wound lay hands on them. But they stood on their defense well and manly, and long he remembered it who was the nighest to them. But in the end they were borne down by many men, and taken and bonds were set upon them, and they were cast into fetters wherein they sit night long. Then the king ponders what longest and worst of death he shall meet out to them. And when morning came, he let make a great barrow of stones and turf. And when it was done, he let set a great flat stone midmost inside thereof, so that one edge was aloft and the other alow. And so great it was that it went from wall to wall so that none might pass it. Now he bids folk take Sigmund and Sinfjotli and set them in the barrow on either side of the stone, for the worse them he deemed it that they might hear each other's speech, and yet neither might pass one to the other. But now, while they were covering in the barrow with the turf slips, thither came Signy, bearing straw with her, and cast it down to St. Jotny, and bade the thralls hide this thing from the king. They said yea thereto, and therewithal was the barrow closed in. But when night fell, St. said to Sigmund, Be like we shall scarce need meat for a while, for here has the queen cast swine's flesh into the barrow, and wrapped it round about on the outer side with straw. Therewith he handles the flesh, and finds that therein was thrust Sigmund's sword. He knew it by the hilts, as murk it might be in the barrow, and tells Sigmund thereof, and that they were both fain and now. Now Sinfjotli drove the point of the sword up into the big stone, and drew it hard along, and the sword bit on the stone, with that Sigmund caught the sword by the point, In this wise they sawed the stone between them, and let not or all the sawing was done that need be done, as the song sings. Now are they both together loose in the barrow, and soon they cut through the stone and through iron and bring themselves out thereof. Then they go home to the hall, when as all men slept there, and bear wood to the hall and lay fire therein, and with all the folk therein are waked by the smoke and the hall burning over their heads. Then the king cries out, Who kindled this fire I burn with all? Here am I, says Sigmund, with Sinfjotli my sister's son. We are minded that thou shalt wot well, that all the Volsungs are not yet dead. Then he bade his sister come out and take all good things at his hand, and great honor and fair atonement in that wise for all her griefs. But she answered, Take heed now and consider. If I had kept King Sagir in memory and the slaying of the Volsung king, I let slay both my children, whom I deemed worthless for the revenging of my father. And I went into the woods to thee in witchwife shape, and now behold, Sinfjotli is the son of thee and of me both. Therefore he has so great hardihood and fierceness in that he is the son of both Volsung's son and Volsung's daughter. For this and for naught else have I so wrought that Sagir might get his bane at last, and these things I have done that vengeance might befall him, and that I too might not live long. Merrily now will I die with King Sagir, though I was not merry to wed him. Therewith she kissed Sigmund her brother and Sinfjotli, and went back into the fire, and there she died with King Sagir and all his good men. But the two kinsmen gathered together folk and ships, and Sigmund went back to his father's land, and drave away thence the king, who had set himself down there in the room of King Volsung. So Sigmund became a mighty king, and far famed, wise and high-minded. He had to wife one Barkild, and two sons that they had between them, one named Helgi, and the other named Hammond. And when Helgi was born, Norns came to him, and spake over him, and said, He should be in time to come, the most renowned of all kings. Even therewith was Sigmund come home from the wars, and so therewith gives him the name of Helgi, and that these matters are tokens thereof, land of rings, sunlitten hills, 
and sharp shearing swords, and withal prayed that he might grow of great fame and like unto the kin of the Volsungs. And so it was that he grew up high-minded and well-beloved, and above all other men in all prowess. And the story tells that he went to wars when he was fifteen winters old. Helgi was lord and ruler over the army, and Sinfjotli was gotten to be his fellow herein. And so the twain bear sway thereover. While we were between chapters, we mentioned earlier that this episode is sponsored by Audible. I personally cannot recommend Audible enough. Being able to download titles and listen offline anytime and anywhere is extremely convenient. Recently, I've been listening to Lines of Departure by Marco Close, and it's a real treat. It's also just one of thousands of audiobooks that are available through Audible. If you have any favorite Audible titles, send us a message. We're always looking for new stories to listen to. If you're not already an Audible member, you can visit audibletrial.com slash thescaldcircle to begin your trial and download your free audiobook today. If you sign up and you're not certain what to download right away, don't worry about it. Your credits last for a year, so Audible never makes you feel rushed. Chapter 9 How Helgi the son of Sigmund won King Hodbrod and his realm and wedded Sigrun. Now, the tale tells that Helgi in his warring met a king height hunting, a mighty king and lord of many men in many lands. They fell to battle together, and Helgi went forth mightily, and such was the end of that fight that Helgi had victory, but King Hunding fell, and many of his men with him. But Helgi is deemed to have grown greatly in fame because he had slain so mighty a king. Then the sons of Hunding draw together a great army to avenge their father. Hard was the fight betwixt them, but Helgi goes through the folk of these brothers unto their banner, and there slays these sons of Hunding, Alf and Eolf, Herward and Ahagbart, and wins there a great victory. Now as Helgi fared from the fight, he met a many women right fair and worthy to look on, who rode in exceedingly noble array, but one far exceeded them all. Then Helgi asked them the name of that their lady and queen, and she named herself Sigrin, and said she was daughter of King Hogni. Then said Helgi, Fare home with us, good welcome shall ye have. Then said the king's daughter, Other work lies before us than to drink with thee. Yea, and what work, king's daughter? said Helgi. She answers, King Hogni has promised me to Hodbrot, son of King Ramnar. I have vowed a vow that I will have him to my husband no more than if he were a crow's son, and not a king's. And yet will the thing come to pass. But if thou standest in the way thereof, and goest against him with an army, and takest me away with all, for verily with no king would I rather bide on bolster than with thee. Be a good cheer, king's daughter, says he. For certes, he and I shall give try the matter, or ever thou be given to him, yea, we shall behold which may prevail against the other, and hereto I pledge my life. Thereafter, Helgi sent men with money into their hands to summon his folk to him, and all his powers is called together to Redburg and there Helgi abode till such time as a great company came to him from Hedensee, and therewith came mighty power from Norvi Sound, aboard great and fair ships. Then King Helgi called to him the captain of his ships, who was Kite Leaf, and asked him if he had told over the tale of his army. A thing not easy to tell, Lord, said he. On the ships that came out of Norvi Sound are twelve thousand men, and over where are half again as many. Then bade King Helgi turn into the firth called Varen's Firth. And they did so, but now there fell on them so fierce a storm, so huge a sea, that the beat of the waves on board and bow was to hearken the like, crashing together of high hills broken. But Helgi bade men fear not, nor take in any sail, but rather hoist every rag higher than their two four. But little did they miss a foundering, or ever they made land. Then came Sigrin, daughter of King Hogni, down on the beach with a great army, and turned them away thence to a good haven called Gnupland. But the landsmen see what had befallen, and come down to the seashore. The brother of King Holbrod, lord of a land called Swarin's Cairn, cried out to them, and asked them who was captain over that mighty army. 
Then up stands Sin Fiotli, with a helm on his head, shining bright as glass, and Birni as white as snow, a spear in his hand, and thereon a banner of renown, and gold-rimmed shield hanging before him. And he knew well what words to speak to kings. Go thou and say when thou hast made an end of feeding thy swine and thy dogs, and when thou beholdest thy wife again, that here are come the Volsungs, and in this company may King Helgi be found. If Hordbrod be fain of finding him, for his game and his joy it is to fight and win fame, while thou art kissing the handmaids by the fireside. Then answered Granar, In no wise knowest thou how to speak seemly things, and to tell of matters remembered from the old, whereas thou layest lies on chiefs and lords. Most like it is that thou have long been nourished with wolf meat abroad in the wild woods, and hast slain thy brethren, and a marvel it is to behold that thou darest to join thyself to the company of good men and true, thou who hast sucked the blood of many a cold corpse. Sintrotli answered, Dim belike has grown thy memory now, of how thou wert a witch-wife on Verency, and wouldst fain have a man to thee, and chose to me that same office of all the world, and how thereafter thou wert a Valkyria in Asgarth, and well nigh came to this, that for thy sweet sake should all men fight, and nine wolf whelps I begat on thy body, in lowness and the father to them all. Gramnar answers, Great skill of lying hast thou, yet belike the father of naught, all mayest thou be since thou wert gelded by the giant's daughters of Thrasnes, and lo, thou art the stepson of King Sigir, and were wont to lie abroad in the wilds and woods with the kin of wolves, and unlucky was the hand wherewith thou slewest thy brethren, making for thyself an exceeding evil name, said Sinfjotli. Mindest thou not then, when thou were a stallion, Granny's mare, and how I rode thee an amble on Bravol, and afterwards thou wert giant Golnir's goat herd. Ranmar says, Rather I would feed fowls with the flesh of thee than wrangle any longer with thee. Then spake King Helgi, Better word for thee, and many more manly deed to fight rather than to speak such things as if it was a shame to even hearken to. Granmar's sons are no friends of me and of mine, yet are they hardy men none the less. Then... Grandma rode away to meet King Hodbrod, at a stead called Sunfells, and the horses of the twain were named Svipod and Svegud. The brothers met in the castle porch, and Grandma told Hodbrod of the war news. King Hodbrod was clad in Birni and had his helm on his head. He asked, What man are an I? Why look ye so wrathful? Grandma says, Here are come the Volsungs, and twelve thousand men of them afloat on the coast and seven thousand are at the island called Sok. But at the stead called Grinder is the greatest company of all, and now I deem with all that Helgi and his fellowship have good will to give battle. Then said the king, Let us send a message through all our realm and go against them. Neither let any who is fain of fight sit idle at home. Let us send word to the sons of Ring, and to King Hogni, and Alf the Old, for they are mighty warriors. So the hosts met at Wolfstone, and fierce fight befell there. Helgi rushed forth through the host of his foes, and many a man fell there. At last folk saw a great company of shield maidens, like the burning flames to look on, and there was come Sigrun, the king's daughter. Then King Helgi fell on King Hodbrod, and smote him and slew him, even under his very banner, and Sigrun cried out, Have thou thanks for thy so manly deed, now shall we share the lands between us and a day of great good hap this to me. And for this deed thou shalt get honor and renown, in that thou hast felled to the earth so mighty a king. So Helgi took to him that realm and dwelt there long, when he had wedded Sigrun and became a king of great honor and renown, though he has not more to do with this story. And that is chapter 7 through 9 of the Volsunga Saga from Norse Mythology. Thank you for listening to our story. If you enjoyed it, we recommend taking a look at our Patreon page, as noted in the description below. You can earn great rewards while also supporting us to keep these stories alive for generations to come. Also remember to subscribe to us on your podcast app, and to leave us a five-star rating if you enjoyed this story. 
A special thank you to Kat for their support this month. Without your contribution, we would not be able to continue these stories, and we truly appreciate it. Visit thescaldcircle.com to stay up to date with all of our current events, news, and much more. Not only that, but you can also visit our story archive of every tale we have ever told. It's sorted by origin and region for the convenience of your listening. Thank you for listening to our story. Don't forget, this episode is sponsored by Audible, the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks. While this story is over, you can visit audibletrial.com slash thescaldcircle to begin your trial and download your free audiobook today. Let us know what you've listened to recently on Audible via our Facebook page. We're always looking for new recommendations.